name is uh, Charlotte uh, Chan from University of Michigan, and uh, she'll talk about generic character shifts for for horror Thank you for the introduction, and thank you very much for the invitation. It's really an honor to be here and give a talk in front of such people. Um, so I'd like to talk about uh, recent joint work with Roman Bezrupadnikov. Um, uh, and the, the place I'd like to start um, is uh, about representations of um, finite groups of Lie type. And this is due to uh, Deline and, um, and Lustig. And uh, so let me, let me say a little bit about that first. Um, and so this G not here, um, I'll be clear later why this is called Q0, I, I hope. This is a connected reductive group over FQ. And uh, but Galina and Lustig established and um their paper of 1976 is that uh is is basically a a, a pretty good understanding of what these representations look like. And uh and the way they did it is the following thing is they said, well, you take your G naught and you consider pairs consisting of a maximal torus inside here, um, together with a character of this maximal torus. Um, um, so yeah, so throughout my representations will be basically over C. Uh, uh, there will be a lot of l adic cohomology, so maybe it's better to put QL here. Um, I learned only yesterday during Alain's talk that I might be killed for talking about l adic methods, so <laughs> please spare me. Um, or maybe I asked the organizers for protection since you invited me. <laughs> okay, so um, there's a map here that goes to... Go right? Say again? Go no? Okay. yes, thank you. Virtual representations of you know, of FQ. And the recipe goes as follows. Oh, okay, hopefully I have room for this. Okay, so here's here's the way it goes. So what the Lina and Lustig uh, construct is a variety X. Um, it's a nice, uh, yeah, this variety X, it's, it's basically, uh, it's very close to being a sub variety of, um, the flag variety. And this X is uh, uh, special in that it has two, it has commuting actions of your original group and the torus that you chose over here. And so for each each such thing here, we're getting an X over here. So I, I won't decorate it with, with this information, but I'll put the zero here. Um, so, right, so there's an action of G naught of FQ. And there's also an action of T naught of FQ. And uh, now T naught is not central inside G naught. So, so these, these two actions are, are, I mean, this action is not the one that just comes from restricting this action. It's important that they commute. And the reason that's important is, is that if I take cohomology of this now, each of these cohomology groups also has a, a, an action of this product of groups. Okay, so, oh, bar also here. Now, this thing right here is a QL bar vector space. And so therefore I have a representation now of this product. So I'm not going to uh, care about which uh, degree things occur in, so I'm just going to take an alternating sum. And because of this alternating sum, that's why I only a priori get a virtual representation here. Okay, so how am I going? What's the last piece of information that I haven't yet chosen? Uh, uh, put into the right hand side is this character here. And so what I will do is I will look inside each of these vector spaces and only take the, the piece where this T naught action is, is by this, this theta here. So this theta is specified by this T naught. Um, so now I get this representation of G naught of F and that's, that's, the, that's the recipe. And then this guy, 
is often denoted by RTG theta. So here's a fact. Is that RT not RTG theta is irreducible if and only if um, the stabilizer of this theta under the wild group is trivial. And what we say is that theta is in general position. Um, okay. In fact, RTG theta in this case can be characterized um, uh, in an elementary way. So let me write down this characterization. Okay, so. Did someone see my name? Okay. Um, let this be a character in general position. Sorry, what does irreducible mean for virtual representation? Uh, it might be minus an irreducible. Okay. So but the absolute value okay. is irreducible. Yeah. So sometimes it does happen that the this, this will be actually minus. Um, for example, uh, in, the, in the case of a Drinfeld curve, with, which I believe predates this story, um, uh, if you take theta uh, non-singular, which is a slightly bigger class than in general position, then actually everything, this theta isotopic component will be inside H1. So as I've defined it, it'll be actually minus the year. Okay, so let theta be in general position. Then this RTG theta is the unique irreducible representation of G naught of FQ such that um, set aside the following uh, character formula. So I guess I'll call this pi. So this is the character of pi. Uh, and this says that up to plus or minus, and it'll be the same plus or minus for, for all such gamma. This is simply given by the really easy formula of be, uh, being an average over the while orbit um, of this theta. This is holds for all elements. Um, but it holds for the regular semi-simple ones. Okay. I'm being a little bit imprecise here. You should, I mean, this is not always over the wild group. This is over like the, what do you call it? Like the transportation from wherever uh, your regular semi-simple torus was into, into T naught. So sometimes this, this, um, this, uh, this indexing set is empty. Um, but if it's not empty, then it's the full wild group. So I'll just write it like this. Okay, so uh, this, this theorem is um, due to Delene and Lustig um, in the existence of this, that has this formula. Um, and it's due to Lustig for uniqueness. Um, Okay, uh, so uh, one other slight comment. So this, this uniqueness requires a largeness condition on Q. And that's basically because if Q is too small, then you can't tell the difference between these numbers. Okay, so here's a, oh, so with this theorem, I think there's a natural question that we can ask is, in general, if you have a representation in your hand and you know its character, how much do you need to know about the character to recover the full representation? Obviously, if you have a full character, then you have everything. But if many times, even in this case, uh, there might be some, some locus where the character is much simpler than, than in full generality. Um, and so, so let me... Uh, uh, okay, okay, I think it's not worth writing down that question. But um, let me... Let me write down a, a spoiler. Um, is, so 
suppose we uh, had in our hand a, a finite dimensional representation of a complex Lie group. Um, the character of this is a continuous function. And so it means that if you know what the character values are on a dense subset, then you know what the character is everywhere because you can just take the limit, right? And now limit, that's an analytic thing. That's not a concept that comes from representation theory. So, um, so I'll just write that for the words I've said. And so one question we can ask is, well, what happens if we have FQ? In FQ, obviously that won't work where everything is fine, right? And, um, and what I'll, one of the driving motivations today maybe can be thought of as the following is that um, uh, what Lustig proved in his theory of character shoes, amongst other things, uh, is, is that this limit should be replaced by a, a concept that comes from algebraic geometry. And that concept is intermediate extension. Um, and so even though this, this character um, of this representation is not so, I mean, we know what it is by Deline and Lustig, but it's not as, um, not as simple to understand as over here. Um, we can say that outside of this regular semi-simple locus, the, the character values are actually controlled by a geometric phenomenon over here. So let me write that down. So uh, not regular semi-simple locus. Um, this is determined by intermediate extension. Okay. <laughs> So again, this is, I mean, right, okay. So uh, section two, um, so now uh, there are many reasons to care about representations of groups like this. One reason is that these are closely related to super cuspidal representations. And, um, and so with that in mind, uh, a natural object that comes up is parahoric subgroups of, uh, such uh, opiatic groups. So let me tell you a little bit about this. Um, and the spoiler here is that we hope to do everything on this board also in this context. Um, so what is the setup now? I take a connective reductive group over a non recumedian local field. And um, I might have a Q later on. So Q will just be the size of the residue field of F here. Um, if I take, um, so I will always take an unramified maximal torus. Um, and uh, from this unramified maximal torus, what I will do is I will choose a point in the building. Um, an F rational point in the building that lies in the apartment associated to this. So in the case that everything is related to uh, a supercuspidals, this torus is chosen to be elliptic. And in that elliptic case, this intersection just contains one thing. But I mean, a priori, if you didn't care about uh, supercuspidals, you can do this even for uh, a non-elliptic thing. You just have many choices for what this X can be. Unramified it splits over an unramified Yeah, unramified means it splits over an unramified extension. Yeah. Okay. So, so uh, from this uh, theory, Ruhatid's theory, we obtain a parahoric group scheme, which I'll denote by GX0, is defined over all X. <laughs> Okay, here's the theorem. <coughs> to think about, and I, I'm really just going to more or less take this theorem and we'll put it over here. So, um, let theta be OF, um, 
smooth and uh, sufficiently generic. So this notion of sufficiently generic is supposed to be the, uh, the version of in general position, but it's actually stronger than that. So there's some extra generosity that appears and that extra generosity will appear for, uh, many times in throughout the talk. And at the end, I'll tell you how to try to get rid of that generosity, extra generosity condition. Then there exists a, uni a unique irreducible of gx zero such that the character of this is equal to, again, plus or minus the while orbit for all gamma, gamma. Yeah, so there's a question of what's, what's gamma now. Um, and it turns out that the replacement of regular semi-simple is uh, a word that, um, yeah, is, is called very regular. Um, and I think this uh, this very regular terminology, I mean, uh, it's originally in French, I translated it into English. Please don't make me say it. Um, but I think, uh, in fact, uh, dates back to Gerda, um, and then also was used by Enyart in a lot of GLN works. Um, so let me say in words what very regular means. So a very regular el uh, element inside this parahoric is a regular semi-simple element inside my piatic group um, with, with some extra condition. And the extra condition basically says that when you reduce mod P, it looks regular semi-simple in, um, in the reductive quotient. So in the connective reductive group over a finite field. So this W is over the value for that reductive quotient. Uh, the W is, yes, that's right. That's the same, yes. Mm -hmm. Sorry, what kind yeah. of an object is pi? Pi is an irreducible representation of GX0. But, but uh, like it's, a, it's an infinite dimensional thing? Or? Ah, no, it's a finite dimensional thing. So if everything is smooth. Uh, maybe I forgot to say this. Everything is smooth. And so in fact, everything will uh, factor through some large quotient. And then in the end, you're just talking about a finite dimensional representation of a finite group. But that finite group is not you know, the points of a reductive group, well, these points of a some object group. So you don't assume that Z comes from a reductive group over O of That's right. Yes. That's right. Okay. So, um. Sorry, so just to normalize in some yeah. extreme case where the power is an O of Hori. Yeah. Then that would just be one dimension. That's uh, no, 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 not one dimensional, but the character values on the very regular element is just given by theta. But not one dimensional. It will not be, no, but it's only given by theta on this small part. Yeah, it will not be, it may not, I mean, it can be one dimensional. It, yeah, okay, sorry, I was thinking of a split case. Yeah, okay, yeah. okay. Um, okay, so we have two statements here, existence and uniqueness. Um, existence is due to myself and Alexander Ivanov, and a uniqueness is due to myself and Masao Oi. A few years apart. Um, so let me tell you about unique uh, existence. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Yes. Um, so uniqueness will always require Q to be large enough. Existence doesn't. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, so what is the construction here? Well, the first thing is I said verbally to Jacob, which is that everything is uh, everything factors through some large quotient. So the smoothness implies that we can pass us to a finite quotient um, of of this product of groups, um, and. And let me tell you about how to pass to this. So we have the moi Prasad filtration. Yeah. Does your data does, doesn't seem to depend on X, the input data. Like you just have theta, right? I just have theta, yes. And then I mean theta dependent on X, uh, I guess mildly, yes. Yeah, there are other T's that okay, yeah. But no, T is just in G, right? T, T is just in G. I mean, maybe the X. X is chosen to be okay. in here. So, so there's some compatibility. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. 
uh, have the more facade filtration. Okay, so we have. Uh, Okay, no. So we have the moi Prasad filtration, which is a, a um, filtration of subgroups, subgroup schemes inside this GX0. Um, and then actually we have an additional one, R plus here. And basically this is a union of all the things strictly bar, bigger than R. So sometimes these two things are the same, sometimes they're different. Um, in our case, I think if you take R to be an integer, then these things will always be different. Um, okay, so here. <laughs> is I'm going to define an algebraic group and this algebraic group defined over FQ will take uh, any R algebra and send it to GX zero of R quotient by GX R plus of W R. There's something to check here, but this does um, this recipe is uh, representable by an affine algebraic group. Um, and this W here means the bit ring if my F is in character six zero, and it just means, um, I guess, power series, if formal power series, if F has positive characteristic. Okay. And with this also comes, um, one can also formulate a notion of TR inside here. Um, and the idea is that the existence comes from doing this same picture, but now with GR and TR replacing G naught and T naught. Um, and so we have a variety XR that comes with commuting actions of GR of FQ. So it's what? This GR is dimensional. Finite dimensional. This will be like, uh, so for example, if uh, say X is hyper special inside GL2, GL2, then this thing will look like GL2, say FQ or R, T2, T to the R plus one. In the equal characteristic oh, case. In the equal characteristic case, case. yeah. Okay. Where does the ring R vary? Like Say again. You know how which kind of rings are. <clears throat> ah, so I I think I want to allow um any algebra over FQ. Um. Yeah. So I, I so I believe what happens is that um everything I do since I'm in at all uh, Aladic at all situation I don't have to worry about whether I take perfections and so forth. So just for yeah simplicity, let me. I'm since you confused by this group when you are, that's infinite dimensional. So how do you get something finite dimensional? Yeah, well this quotient is really big. So what's the definition of it? Of this one? Yes. Um so in in the case uh, GL2, for instance, this is, this will be things that are equal to one modulo the uniformizer to some very large power. Um, in general, then it's a condition about uh, the pairings between X and the various roots that come up inside your gene. That's satisfying. Yes, so you can think to this as an algebraic group about the residue field. Yes, that's right. Yes, exactly. Yeah, this is an algebra. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly my perspective. Thank you. Um, so then the pi in the theorem here, this pi is equal to R, T, R, G, R of theta, where we define it in a completely analogous way to over here, uh, over here, this, this definition. So we take the cohomology here, we take the isotopic component with respect to theta, and then we take the alternating sum. Sorry, what is X, I? What x i in the definition? Ah, okay, yeah, yeah. So, so I also didn't define x naught, um, but um, basically, following an idea of loose state, we can uh, write down a definition of x r that's um, completely parallel to the definition of x naught, um, and that's what x r is. Yeah. In the definition, the previous case, one has 
Bohel subgroup is some property, but plays the role of Bohel subgroup. Yeah, so what plays the role, is, uh, let me give it in this case, is uh, I still like to call it BR, and it's just all things that are upper triangular inside there. So it's no longer literally a Borel, as you know. Uh, if I take the quotient of this by this, then I get kind of, I don't get something projective anymore, right? I have some like affine fashioning of it. <clears throat> And actually that point um, will come up later as a point that gets in the way. Um, however, what we can do is, I mean, in your paper, you have another uh, definition known as uh, the uh, Borel's, which are in, in, in some specified position relative to its Frobenius translate, but you can also view it as the, I mean, up to an FI vibration, uh, uh, view it as the in, pre, uh, inverse image under the Lang map of the unipotent part of this. Of the Borel. And that definition, we that's what we take for XR here. Thank you. This construction required G to be quasi split so that you have a rational Borel in the first place. Well, um, so, uh, I mean, I think I'm. Does it, uh, my T, I'm requiring T to be unramified. So I think I already have this. I have, uh, I just need it to be, uh, to have a Borel eventually. I don't need it. Necessarily to have it over FQ. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. So it, kind of in the same way as over here, you can still define what this is because the variety comes from like FQ bar, okay. sometimes a little bit. I mean, um, you might not be able to get down to FQ, but you can always get up to some extension. Okay. Okay. So, um, so uh, I, I made a remark before. That in the elliptic case, this is related to uh, supercuspidal representations, and that that uh, that was proved by Moy Prasad in the nineties. Um, and we have a similar thing over here. So if if T is elliptic, then the compact induction of this R T R G R is. Uh, Irreducible supercuspidal. Um, and so, uh, this is this is something that I studied a, a while ago for um, division algebras, and then uh, even and I studied this for other inner forms of GLN, um, and then Masao and I studied this for for general G. And um, what Masao and I also found um, is that. Uh, this kind of parametrization of um, leading from theta to this compact induction is compatible with Pasha Kalita's L packets. Um, so this will come back at the end of the talk in some future applications of uh, the character sheaves I will talk about later. Okay, so character sheaves for G not now. Sorry, and that, that yeah. compact induction is to GX. Oh, What's that again? The compact induction is to GX zero. Oh, uh, the compact induction is to G of F, and it's from GX zero O F. But actually, you sometimes need to extend by center if there is one. So, but that's kind of a mild thing. So, uh, Z. So that's a compact induction. Okay, so uh, this this theory is due to Lustig, and the beginnings of this theory um, uh, 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 started with what we call the Rothenberg Springer resolution. And I'll I'll write out exactly what this is. Um, yes, yes, I'm, oh, I, I'm, I, in some sense, I'm always over a finite field. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's my existence. Um, yeah, but yeah, I'm, I'm in, in G, not in a classical case now. Um, so this is the growth and the Springer resolution. Um, and 
Uh, this map is simply given by projection to the first coordinate. And this map is given by, well, I have H inverse GH inside B naught, and so I can map to T naught. Okay. So um, I, uh, I don't 100% know the, the, um, the way the history worked here, but um, my understanding is that this was uh, first introduced by Springer in the in the Lie algebra case, um, and the analog of this upper thing is it's a resolution of the Nilpotent cone. Um, and uh, but but let me say for maybe an average person why why you might come up with a diagram of this type. Um, um, and so, so basically there's two things. So what we will do with this diagram is we will take something on T like we have done over there. We'll pull back to this G naught tilde and then we'll push forward onto this G naught. Okay, so there's a question, what kind of thing does that, that, does that look like? And um, the, the spoiler is that if you started with a, a, a local system over here and you did this process, then you'll end up with up to um, up to shift a uh, perverse sheaf. Okay, so here's a remark of how you would uh, translate this. It is uh, so say uh, say you like stacks, um, then you can consider the stacks given by in each of these uh, the action you're quotienting by is the adjoint action. What you do here is you pull back and you push forward. And what that looks like is that's parabolic induction. And if you apply the forgetful functor to, to this uh, pull push, you will get this one. Just by definition, just tracing through definitions. Um, if you like representation theory, then if you write down the character formula for parabolic induction, uh, the categorification of that uh, like formally, that formula formally is, is exactly the pull push of this diagram here. So this is, um, I mean, maybe the first time you see it, you don't know why someone would write this down, but in fact, this is a really natural thing to write down. Okay, and so here's a theorem. Um, I, hang on, let me think about. Um, where I want to write this. Okay, I think it's okay. Yeah. Here. So here's a theorem of Lustig. But say I take L, a multiplicative local system. So uh, multiplicative means that it's, it behaves well with respect to the multiplication map on T naught. Um, you were about to add it like growth of finite. Say again? Um, you were about to add it like growth Yes, of yes, I'm over the algebraic group. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I take my L multiplicative local system um, on T naught in general position. Then If I take the pole of L and push over here, what I get is a simple perverse sheaf. And this thing is isomorphic to the intermediate extension of the restriction to the regular semi-simple locus, which I will just write like this. Sorry for the abuse of notation. Um, moreover, so maybe I put this as two bullet points um, because the proof is quite different for these two bullet points. Is if this L is Frobenius equivariant, then so is its parabolic induction. Um, And once you have something that's for Venus equivalent over here, then sheaves to functions 
correspondence gives you a natural way to decategorify these this object and get just a function, right? And by this explanation over here, we know that that function that you get is going to be a class function. So natural question when you have a class function in your hand is whether it comes from the character of a actual representation. And the answer is yes. And the way we prove that, or not we, we say, uh, proves this is, uh, is that if you take the function corresponding to this, you will get up to a sign the character of the delin lustig induction of the decategorification of this local system over here. So everything is compatible. <clears throat> so I should say in general, it's not always the case that um, a character sheaf uh, uh, has a decategorification that's actually the, uh, a character. Um, in general, they are what Lustig calls almost characters, but in this case, they're an actual characters. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Any questions? So, Sorry, when you say in this case, they're actually characters, what do you mean by this case? Like, uh, this case here, this character sheet. Okay. Not all character sheets look like this. Oh, I see. Okay, so, so the thing to guess based on the structure is that the next thing is character sheets for GR. Oh, right, there's a, like this, okay. Is that the line? for PR. Okay. So what game can we play? We can take everything over here and replace all the zeros by R and hope that something works out. So we again have an analog of this. Um, yeah. Okay. And so I will, oh, I, well, I didn't even name these two. So, so we can write down an analog of this where we replace all the zeros by Rs. And the BR then, remember, is not actually a Borel, but it's kind of, it's playing the role of the Borel as uh, analogous to this example over here. Um, of a BR? Yes, uh, yeah, but uh, what T is and what uh, this does it use? Ah, okay, yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, so let's take let's take the the split case inside GLN. Then what this will look like? Then TR will be. Um, all the, okay, well, let's start with GR. GR will be GLN of, um, let me write it like this, O modulo pi to the R plus one. So, I mean, this side is a group and that side is a algebraic group. So it's, so take this with a grain of salt. Um, TR, we can take to be the diagonals inside this. So in each one you have, O, o star modulo one plus pi to the r, r plus one. And BR, we take the upper triangulars containing this. Um, so then if you want the non, uh, yeah. So, so uh, somehow uh, in, in this story and this story that I didn't explain clearly, I'm now kind of always working over F cube bar. I'm always working geometrically. And so I always have this Borel. And so how do I recover some information from a non-split torus? Well, I can change the rational structure by, for instance, conjugating by uh, maybe an element of, like a coxeter element inside the wild group. And that will uh, uh, obtain for me as the FQ points, the fixed points under that twisted uh, Frobenius will be, uh, will actually not be the diagonal, diagonals inside GLNFQ, but it'll be like FQ to the N star inside GLNFQ. Is, is that okay? Okay. Um, yeah. So here's a conjecture. 
Yeah, yeah. So in, in a simplistic result, like uh, the chain large x star, and what what is that? Oh, this is an intermediate extension from the regular. I mean, a constant shape. What? Like you are taking intermediate extension. Yeah, I'm taking intermediate extension of the of the restriction of this. Oh. That restriction is actually a local system there. Um, for the simple reason that if you look at the regular semi-simple locus here and you look at uh, what this G naught tilde looks like over it, it's something really simple. It's a, a tall map that with Galois group, the wild group. Okay. okay, so conjecture is if L is a multiple is a multiplicative local system uh, sufficiently generic. Um, this R version of parabolic induction is simple numbers. Any questions? Yeah. Is there any relationship? Can you understand x naught from this? In, in this theorem, is there some way to understand? No. Yeah. No. yeah. So basically, there are two different. I mean, one is using geometry to construct representations. One is using geometry to construct some equivariant um, shapes. And the relation is that the de natural decategorifications of both of them end up with something that agrees. But, There's no actual relation. But I think, measure. yeah. Yeah, and I mean, if there was, a lot of these proofs would be a lot easier. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so let me talk about why this is a conjecture and, and doesn't follow from this thing, or is that uh, the proof of this first bullet point um, is the follow is uh, uh, comes from studying the geometry of this pi here. This pi is proper um and that's because i mean the fibers are all inside this uh this g mod b here it's proper and it's also small and what small means is that the parts of g where the fiber is big is not big <laughs> yeah okay parse that correctly yeah so um uh, and so what that tells you is that when you push forward, you can control what happens to the various cohomology groups and the support of all of that, and, and it gives you this per perversity statement. Um, however, when we look over here, um, uh, as we can see from this example or, or this GLN example, this map pi now, the fibers are inside this GR mod BR, which is this affine fattening of a projective thing. So it's no longer proper. I couldn't say, okay, maybe we can hope it's still small. It's not small either. So both things that we used crucially in order to get this first statement fail. Um, so um, Lustig made this conjecture maybe 20 years ago. Um, um, and, uh, and what he could, he could prove it in most cases for R equals to one, the first positive case and R equals to three, but not R equals to two or anything bigger than r equals to three. And basically he told me that uh, his strategy of computing um, this parabolic induction for one L at a time resulted in computations that were too difficult. It was just not tractable after, after r became too big, too big being bigger than three. Um, and so uh, uh, Roman and I, uh, I mean, we tried a lot of things actually. I mean, if you have something that's not proper or or small, maybe you can try to deal with one thing and then the other thing. So we tried to deal with proper by constructing some compactification and proving some cleanness statement. This didn't work. Um, and anyway, so uh, the, the perspective that did work is to kind of zoom out, which is to not prove something about uh, each of these parabolic inductions one by one, but to prove something about the functor parabolic induction on the category. Um, so, so here, here uh, let me write down the theorem first, and then I'll, I'll write down the theorem that implies the theorem. Um, so, 
L is a multiplicative local system, sufficiently generic. Um, so then, I guess first bullet point, uh, this X conjecture is true. Um, and we get the analog of this, but now we replace regular semi-simple by this very regular locus. Um, and um, we are on the very regular locus. So that says D reg. And the second thing is we'll want to know is the relation to actual representation theory. And what we can do is to say that the decategorification matches with the decategorification of the cohomology of this XR here. Okay, I mean, uh, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll just shorthand it. So in order to talk about the function corresponding, you still need as input some Frobenius equivariant object. Once you have that, then the statement holds. Up to a sign of chi r pr gr. Okay. So any any questions over here? There's some good classification of uh, characteristics on TR. On TR, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I think this is already, I think Lucic proved that character sheets on an abelian group um, are as you would expect them to be. They're multiplicative local systems. Yes. Okay, maybe. Okay, I hope I'm not saying that. Um, so I should say what um, when Lustig made this conjecture, he made it in a paper called Character Shapes and Generalizations. And in this paper, he discussed three arcs, one of them being commutative um, algebraic groups, uh, second one being unipotent groups. That, uh, and that theory has been completed by uh, by work of Mitya Borachenko and Benrir uh, Drenfeld. Um, and then the third arc is groups like this. That's what this fills in. Maybe I want to ask is whether some good property like star push forward is not necessarily true. What say again? Say again. Like star push forward is like shift, uh, like when you come back. Ah, oh, okay, okay, yeah. So I think if directly on TR, I don't think that's the case. But in fact, in the proof, what we do is to compare what happens to this one, and if you reverse the role of star and shriek and and that's how we obtain um that's how we obtain um uh, t exactness of the functor yeah but that that property is really strongly depends on some generosity property so we don't know how to show that in general um and the uh, maybe i say a little bit more the, the idea is that this affine bit that is messing everything up that part can be controlled by generosity properties on, on um, the the input sheet. Okay, so so um, I'll only talk about the proof of the first bullet. Could you say one word about what sufficiently general means? It, what sufficiently general? Yeah, it just ah yeah yeah. Uh -huh. So you have your TR. You look at the deepest part of TR. That thing just looks like a. That's just a. That's just a Lie algebra. And so inside the Lie algebra, you have all the, um, the, the, I guess, yeah. Inside there, you look at um, all the uh, oh, one dimensional things coming from the roots. And the condition is that you have to be non trivial on all of them. Um, okay, so the proof is instead of studying uh, uh, 
each one in isolation, you study the functor. And so um, the proof is to use the following thing is to uh, let E uh, psi be a sufficiently generic multiplicative local system on this piece that I just told Akshay about, the deepest part of TR. And to consider, and on this Lie algebra, there's also a notion of parabolic induction. And I'm going to let F psi be the parabolic induction of that E psi. So it turns out that with respect to convolution inside the bounded derived category of constructible shapes or TR equivariant constructible shapes on TR and inside analogous object on GR, inside here, E psi is an idempotent and F psi is also an idempotent. And the reason for that is that E psi comes as the Fourier transform of, uh, of a skyscraper on one element. And so, so that's the proof. Um, uh, and so what we do is we construct, we consider not the entire category here, but some generic part of the, these categories. Um, and it turns out that parabolic induction, this uh, pi full push, gives a map from here to here. But this map is really nice. It's equivalence of categories, and it's also T exact. Um, moreover, basic, uh, uh, by appealing to Fourier transform, what we can do is uh, we can show that uh, these subcategories are are closed under taking sub quotients, for example, and so and also sub objects. And so, in particular, what this tells us is that if I started with a uh, simple perverse object over here, I will end up over here with a simple perverse object. All of these notions are compatible. Okay. So in the last few minutes. Okay, let me let me say something about um, the proof of the second bullet point, and then I will say one more theorem. Um, okay, so I've said a little bit about what goes into this first bullet point, but actually to, to prove the second bullet point involves a whole other um, description of what these perverse sheets um, are. Uh, and, uh, and basically the structure goes to, um, instead of uh, doing this thing where you feed in the choice of one for L, you allow the uh, 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 a kind of beefed up version of um, the growth and deep Springer vibration where you're allowed to feed in a whole sequence of Borels. And in particular, you can uh, feed in a sequence of Borels where it's just given by an orbit under the uh, under some Frobenius that's not actually fixing your Borel. And that allows you to make some calculation and that tells you that these two sides are equal up to a scalar. So that gives you halfway. And then there's the matter of actually figuring out what that scalar is. And there's a number of ways to do it. I think originally in Lustig's work, he did it by calculating um, on uni regular unipotent elements on the two sides. Um, but actually there's, there's another way. Um, and the other way is to use the theorem from before um, and calculate on regular semi-simple elements. So that general structure essentially works over here as well. Um, one caveat is that uh, any two Borels inside G naught are conjugate under G naught, but any two BRs may not be conjugate under GR. And the most obvious case of this is um, in the example that I actually mentioned, is if you take Iwahori, a reasonable BR is to take the upper triangular part or the lower triangular part. These two things are not conjugate inside the Iwahori. Um, and so, so there's this complication, but modulo this, um, uh, you can get the comparison up to a scalar. And then there's the matter again of figuring out the scalar. And what we can do is calculate on very regular elements. And that's good because we know on this side, it's easy because of this isomorphism here. And on this side, it's easy by the theorem that I 
talked about earlier. Okay. Um, so let me um let me end with a comment and a picture. So oh uh, let's call this end of the proof. Um is a uh, uh, is um uh, this is given this we as I said before this is a geometric version of parabolic induction. Well, we chose to go from T to G, but there's a bunch in between, which is you can in general take a parabolic, take a le the levy inside there, and ask whether you can prove the same thing. Now replacing all your T's by L's, yeah, and so that theorem is also true. So also is also okay to replace T's by L's. So in general, um, now the notion of sufficiently generic will change then. Um, as I answered earlier, um, for a torus, you're required to have non-triviality for all of the, uh, all of the roots. Um, for the L case, you're only required to have non-triviality for uh, the roots that are outside the sub subroot system defined by L. Um, and so it's a weaker notion. So, um, and uh, if one is familiar with JKU's construction of supercuspidal representations, seeing this kind of thing is a uh, maybe comforting. And let me uh, draw why that is comforting, and then I'll stop. What, oh, yeah. do, you use? what do you what do you get on? What do you take on L? Any perverse shape here. Oh. Yeah, yeah. I can be a character sheep on L. Yes, that's right. Yeah, you take, uh, yeah. For example, you can take a character sheep on L. Now you have this genericity assumption, and so you might have to view it on this uh, deeper LR and twist by a generic multiplicative local system of LR. But then that gives you something in the L version of this generic subcategory. And then you take parabolic induction and you now get something on this bigger thing. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that question. So this board is, is my parahoric. This is parahoric. This is GX0. Um, maybe I should call it GR. If I call it GR, then uh, it's something finite. So I can complete the box at the bottom. I'm going to view this part as the depth zero part, and then I go all the way down as I go deeper and deeper. So this is stuff that, yeah. So so as you go down, you can just think of it as things with uh, uh, non-trivial coefficients and higher powers of the uh, of the uniformizer. Okay, and uh, so what this kind of looks like um, in this cartoon that's uh, really familiar to at least some subset of this room is uh, the, I'm going to view the middle as kind of the torus. Um, and, uh, and as I extend out from the torus, I'm going to say, say I have positive roots over here, negative roots over here. And so as I go like this, that's indicating bigger and bigger levy subgroups inside uh, my G. Okay. And so uh, Lustig's conjecture said, we want to understand uh, um, or maybe Lustig's conjecture says uh, that he believes there's a nice theory of character shapes for GR. And the first class of objects that we might hope to get are the ones that come from parabolic induction from T. Um, and so that's like, I take a shape here, right, just in the middle line, and I parabolically induce to everything. However, I am required to have this sufficiently generic condition. So this is kind of a strong condition on what else I'm allowed to choose. And so what we can, uh, with, with this second theorem here, we can inductively construct a much larger class. In particular, we do the following thing, which is we start with some 
character shape on a connected reductive group in the sense of classical uh, character shape in the sense of Lustig. That's my character shape right here. It's on some, some small levy, G0, okay? I need some genericity conditions. So I take a multiplicative um, uh, uh, local system on this uh, G0 here. It has some depth and I obtain now a simple perverse sheaf on this small fattened thing. Now I can feed it into this parabolic induction functor because of this theorem. That allows me to extend it to a bigger levy. Now this thing will not be, uh, be uh, and, uh, and that's be because of the genericity of this thing here. Now, this resulting thing will not be generic with respect to some bigger things. However, I can tensor by some other thing, make it a little bit deeper. And this thing will be generic with respect to some slightly larger thing. And so I can now parabolically induce there. And so I just keep doing this tensor induce. Tensor induce. And then at the end, you can tensor if you want. It doesn't really matter. And the point is that uh, from this theorem, we can build from Lustig's depth uh, connective reductive um, uh, character sheaves uh, a bunch of character sheaves for GR using this inductive uh, process. And I'll stop here. Yeah, thank you. Okay, any questions? Could you say more about the compatibility with Kalefa's L packets? Yeah, so um, if you've read this, uh, the, the uh, Hashim's paper on how to put together regular L packets, so he says that inside all of this, all the super hospitals, there's a nice class of them called regular. These come from the situation where the depth zero input is a full RTG theta. Um, and for these, he, uh, he says, okay, well, now we have this map that goes from theta to super cuspidals that look like this. And then you might say, if I want an L packet, I want some nice uh, properties such as stability. And so I can say, well, if I take a stable uh, conjugacy class of this uh, theta, does it end me up with a stable uh, packet of these super cuspidals? Um, and on the nose, the answer is no. And uh, what Tasha did was to uh, construct some kind of rectifying character to fix this. Um, now, now uh, due to recent work of, um, uh, hang on, let me, okay, I just had to figure, I forgot how to do the alphabet of, uh, of uh, Jessica Finson, Tasha Kalita, and Lauren Spice. I just had to sing it in my head to figure out which <laughs> letters came first. Um, uh, we know that actually you can twist or use original correspondence so that Tasha's parameterization in this then goes back to the original thing and that the, the correct thing. Um, and so what I mean by is compatible with L, Tasha's L packets is that um, you don't need any twists or anything. This is on the nose, the thing that you, you want to prove is stable and so forth. Um, and thank you for that question because that reminded me of the application that I want to say is uh, is uh, recent work of Bezra Kavnikov and Varshavsky show that you can use Lustig's character sheaves to prove things like stability using um, using using character sheaves so geometrically and um, our hope the three of us is that uh, we can using this uh, uh, character sheaf theory for um, GR, we can uh, generalize this to prove stability and other character identities um, uh, for the corresponding uh, super hospitals. Yeah. yeah. So you're saying this uh, compatibility holds for non singular packets as well, not just the regular, because what you just said was just for regular, right? Yeah. So, um, so what has it, right? So, uh, no. But, these have conditions on them. So this, this theta is assumed to be uh, sufficiently generic, and this automatically rules you out of the non-singular case. It automatically puts you inside the regular case. Um, I think there should be something in the non-singular case as well uh, using this. Yeah. Any further questions?
There was a so in the in the final picture there was a sensory process. Um, yeah. Um, to go deeper in the R, what what exactly is the object that you're sensoring with? Uh, just a multiplicative local system on LR. Okay. So, in terms the analogy with representation, there you're just tensoring by a one-dimensional representation. Okay. Thank you again.